aircraft if you're not familiar with it. Uh, there is a disp disposable nose cone on the top that's composite. It's jettisoned during ascent like a fairing. The capsule is fully recoverable. It's about 15 cubic metres of volume. Um, and wrapped around the base is a service section that contains the propulsion systems, the recovery systems, parachutes, the LIDARs, the star trackers, everything that can't go inside the pressure vessel is in that service section, which stays permanently attached to the pressure vessel. And then at the base is what we call the trunk, uh, which is where we carry unpressurized cargo to the station. Um, it's open to space at the back, so once we, jet once we are separated from the second stage in orbit, uh, it's open and after berthing with station, the robotic arm on station can reach around the back and unload uh, cargo ORUs uh, for the station and park them on station. It can also reload us with uh, trash for disposal. The trunk is jettisoned prior to re-entry, so we don't bring the trunk back, but we can dispose of unpressurized cargo. It also houses solar arrays and the radiator of the spacecraft. Total payload capacity on a Block 2 Falcon 9 is about 5,500 kilograms of payload capacity. Block one is about 3,300 kilograms of payload capacity. Uh, we can provide both pressurized and unpressurized payloads with power, data and telemetry, and thermal services if needed. Uh, and as I uh, keep hitting, the, both the Dragon and the Falcon 9 spacecraft are designed to carry crew. You'll note that there are windows in this thing, which is kind of a redundant if you're carrying cargo. Dragon status, uh, the left is acoustic testing of the Dragon spacecraft and the qualification unit. Uh, the right is the qual, structural qual testing. Uh, the Draco thrusters in the top left, we've developed 90-pound um, uh, NTO MMH hypergolic thrusters for reaction control and orbiting, orbital maneuvering of the spacecraft. Uh, they are through qualification. Uh, in the bottom left is the propellant tanks, the hypergolic propellant tanks, again developed in-house because we couldn't get a good quote from outside. Uh, both are through qual and on the bottom right is the first three uh, flight thrusters. We also have produced a radio we call Cuckoo Communications, COTS UHF Communications Unit. Um, much to uh, NASA's chagrin, I think that we came up with a bunch of acronyms that were even worse, uh, so they let us keep that name. Uh, part of that was an NSA certified uh, crypto module. Uh, some more flight hardware, lithium polymer battery, pieces of the first flight unit. Uh, heat shield, Pika X heat shield. We make Pika like material in house. Uh, crew capability, as I've mentioned, uh, they're designed from inception to accommodate crew. This is why SpaceX was started. Our immediate focus is certainly on cargo, but in every design decision, the ability to attain human rating rapidly and at low additional cost is paramount. And I've mentioned that many of the human rating requirements are levied on us by virtue of the fact that we're going to station. Um, features already included, factors of safety, design load cases. The design loads for the capsule are uh, all driven by abort scenarios. So that's what it's designed and qualified to, is worst case abort and re-entry scenarios, which you don't obviously need for cargo. Uh, and windows and uh, all those other features I need to keep moving. The main development for a crew system is a launch escape system. We estimate that will take about two and a half years. Uh, on the other hand, it leverages heavily on capabilities we already have. Uh, there's also a lifeboat dragon option that has been floated where you certify it for the re emergency return of crew only, and that takes the launch escape system off the critical path. You do that in parallel. And NASA is not the only customer for this. So we will go down this road. It's just a matter of timing and the precise uh, capabilities that we execute. Obviously NASA can, uh, if they sponsor this development as they have cargo, then it will move up the timeline somewhat. Just a quick overview of the evolution. How long do I have? Two minutes. Two minutes, excellent. Just to show you where we're going and what we're thinking about. Uh, the Falcon 1 Classic, as we call it, will be retiring this year. It has uh, one flight next month and possibly another one toward the end of the year. Uh, it will be replaced late next year with a Falcon 1E that will just about double the payload capacity. The Falcon 9, we have the 5 meter fairing variant, which will be the initial launch. We have the Dragon variant, which is the COTS and CRS launches. Uh, we believe we can have a crew variant online in 2012 if funding is turned on soon. We also are planning a Falcon 9 Heavy that will be the heaviest lift booster available, 30 metric tons to low Earth orbit. Uh, and we are also have begun initial design of the Raptor um, 
locks hydrogen up a stage, which uh, dramatically increases payload performance. For the spacecraft, uh, obviously we have the cargo dragon, which we're developing for station. We have another application of that spacecraft, or a very similar one we call Dragon Lab, which formulates uh, a microgravity platform, basically, a commercial microgravity platform, received with tremendous enthusiasm by life sciences, materials physics, combustion physics, many of these fields of research within NASA that have seen funding uh, decreased in recent years, and with the shuttle going away will be the only option for putting something up and bringing back samples. Uh, Soyuz has extremely limited return cargo capability. So this is being received with great enthusiasm and so much enthusiasm we've actually booked two missions in late next year and late 2011. So that's what I said, Cargo Dragon to ISS and microgravity, but then when you look at those capabilities it's not a big uh, leap to see that that leverage is nicely toward rendezvous and inspection, a capability that the DOD is very interested in. Uh, and then with a grapple fixture, it becomes a boost or deorbit capability, robotic servicing capability. Crew, as I've mentioned, for ISS and potentially a lifeboat application. But once you've got a crewed dragon, it opens up these options too. Crewed servicing, orbital tourism, and in the long term, we have studied or considered these things. Uh, docking adapters are critical to any space architecture in the end, any exploration architecture. There is not a good one currently available. Um, so we have looked at uh, doing it ourselves and may do that in the future. Landers really are a small extension of the uh, booster and spacecraft capability we've already developed. And ascent and return vehicles are obviously the next thing. Nevertheless, and this is my last slide, uh, we, were, we, we are just getting started and we are trying to stay focused on our immediate commitments while considering the future directions. SpaceX was founded for human spaceflight. Nevertheless, our immediate priorities are COT, CRS and our other customers executing that long manifest that you saw at the beginning. Realize and streamline reusability, which is not assumed in our cost models or business models, but it is philosophically a mandate within SpaceX. Falcon 1 first stage, Falcon 9 first and second stages, and of course the Dragon spacecrafts. We're going to have a, a large supply of second-hand Dragons uh, in the coming years. Uh, and of course dramatically improve responsiveness as well. The whole issue of recovery, refurbishment, recertification for flight has to be tackled. Rollout and launch in one hour is what we've sized the launch site and the Falcon 9 to support. Uh, and of course, the challenge of working with a range when you want to roll out and launch in one hour, it may well mandate commercial ranges. So that's really uh, all I had to say. Um, I just, I, I really believe that what we are doing, commercial crew and cargo, is not in competition with Constellation. It is in fact fundamentally enabling to, con to Constellation. It enables them to do more in less time with the money they have by offloading the housekeeping, the logistics, to commercial. So NASA can go push the envelope, show how it can be done, show that it can be done, how it can be done, and when it becomes routine, hand it off to commercial. That's the, the obvious paradigm that could be followed. Um, I guess there just needs to be a little more faith that commercial can actually execute on this, and we hope to prove that in the very near future. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Our last speaker, and certainly not our least, is Frank L. Culberson, Jr. Frank is Senior Vice President for Orbital Sciences Corporation in Dulles, Virginia, and Deputy General Manager of their Advanced Programs Group. In this capacity, Mr. Culberson's responsibilities include the execution and performance of all orbital programs related to human spaceflight, including the Commercial Orbital Transportation System Program, and the Launch Abort System, program for the Orion spacecraft. Prior to this position at Orbital, Mr. Culberson was a senior vice president of SAIC following an 18-year career as a NASA astronaut. He has flown three space missions and logged over 144 days in space as shuttle commander, pilot, and station crew member. Mr. Culberson is a 1971 graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis he was a naval aviator, a fighter pilot, and a test pilot, and he retired from the Navy as a captain 
1997. Frank Culberson.